So we finally arrived at the end of this hell year 2020, and once again we're getting the buggiest patch of the year, which comes just before CIG goes on holiday break. Luckily though, this one has shaped up to be the most significant of the entire year, and probably one of the most significant since planets were introduced back in 3.0. Hey guys, I'm Morphologist, and in this video, I'm gonna take you guys through the best features of 3.12. Starting off with less significant, but still important features, and then ending strong with the very best feature that we've received this year. And it's a feature that's going to completely transform the way that you play the game. And if you're thinking it has to do with this Idris capital ship, well, it's actually something else. Oh, and if you like the way I did this video and you think I deserve it by the end, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button to help me out. Also consider checking out my Twitch channel, where I stream every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. I've said this numerous times in earlier videos, so it really doesn't need too much more reiterating. Star Citizen's planets are amazing. As if it were possible though, version 3.12 adds to the fidelity of these planets by improving their atmospheres and their textures on the ground, completely redoing several planets in the star system. Not all of them yet, but quite a few of them. The next patch will probably see all of the moons and planets in the Stanton system being redone to this new level of quality. What seems to be particularly improved in this patch is the very close level of detail, as well as atmospheres. Atmospheres in general just look a lot better. 312 has also seen some improvement to FPS combat with the introduction of range finding in some select scopes for sniper rifles, allowing users to zero out to 1.5 kilometers and yes, even land shots. And on the subject of weapons, we've also gotten our hands on two brand new weapons, the A03 from Gemini, which is a high rate of fire, very accurate, smaller caliber weapon that can double as a close range DMR if you want to use it that way. The 15 rounds per magazine makes it very effective in this role, and personally it's going to be a go-to now for my own arsenal. In my experience, it usually is able to drop people in medium armor in one to two shots from medium to long range. Up close, it's pretty deadly too. But if DMRs aren't your thing, you also have the new Bering FS9, which is the go-to LMG or light machine gun of the UEE. This weapon is actually phenomenal. It's got a good rate of fire, 150 rounds, and is very accurate even under sustained fire. You put a compensator on there and it's even better. Personally, I can see this becoming the issued LMG in Armco for our support guys because it just is so effective, but we'll have to see how it works in PvP later on. Next is a quality of life feature, which really is gonna help out new players in Star Citizen who may struggle with finding the entry to their ship. I know it may seem dumb, but a lot of people struggle the first time they try to fly their ship, and so this is a welcome addition for some of the newer members of the community. And on the subject of quality of life and ease of navigation, they've finally gotten around to fixing all of the elevator panels so that they're all using building blocks and much easier to navigate. We also got a really cool new toy in 3.12. We've got now the attachment for the multi-tool that allows us to use a tractor beam. Really great for collecting weapons after you've killed a bunch of pirates, but it's also good for collecting boxes. Eventually, this is going to lead into ships being able to use tractor beams like the Cutlass Black and other select ships that will be used for maybe more nefarious means, but there's also like tugboats and what have you for pulling ships and salvaging. And speaking of salvaging, that reminds me, this is actually a really important prerequisite to having salvaging in the game because you can imagine cutting weapons off of ships and modules out of salvage ships would be pretty difficult because you would not have a way to move those modules around. Now with this tool, you can, and so hopefully we're gonna see that come online sooner rather than later, especially with iCache rolling around next year. A very cool secondary feature of it is that it can actually double as a grappling hook in zero G, but sadly it has a ultimate weight limit, which means that you can't pull yourself behind a moving ship. Hopefully they make a stronger version in the future for those of you who are shipjackers out there. That'd be kind of a cool shipboarding tool, but alas, just yet, it's not possible. However, what is possible is being able to catch projectiles, including missiles and grenades. As you can see in this clip, courtesy of Commander Jack of the Armco community, he was able to catch a size three off a Harby. That's pretty nuts. Unfortunately, he did crash his client, so I wouldn't try this too much. If you're interested in picking up one of these really cool tools, you can find them around the verse. The most reliable place though is Tammany and Sons on Hurston and Lorville, where you can find it in one of the terminals. It's just a bit attachment for your standard multi-tool that we already have in the game, which already includes the mining attachment and the 
cutting attachment, which doesn't really do anything yet, but hopefully that'll tie into salvage gameplay as I said earlier. 312 also snuck the addition of engine blowback in 312, but it doesn't always work quite right. They're still working on force feedback. As you probably saw in 311, there was some quirkiness with it moving the wrong direction too, so they'll probably get this patched up sometime before, you know, maybe the end of the year or possibly early next year. Now we move on to something that might be more interesting for those of you who are ship lovers out there. We've seen the introduction of two new ships from Asperia from their Tavarin lineup. These are the Talon series, the Talon and the Talon Shrike. One is a light fighter, the other one is a light quick attack missile boat. They're both really formidable ships coming with two size one Sucuron stock, and they're very formidable in a dogfight, namely because they are just so incredibly agile. They've also got that really cool boot up sequence like with the Prowler, with the digital screens in the cockpit, which is a really cool touch. And as you probably would expect for an avian based ship, it is incredibly good in atmosphere. In fact, I would say it is the best ship in atmosphere right now in Star Citizen, even better than the Arrow and the Gladius. But now it's time for us to move into the big stuff. And the most noticeable feature of 312 by far is the addition of Star Citizen's gas cloud tech. This stuff is absolutely gorgeous. Where the feature I'm going to talk about at the end of this video is going to transform the way you play, this feature transforms the way you feel. It absolutely makes it a jaw-dropping, awe-inspiring event every time you visit a Lagrange point. And this tech is legitimately volumetric. It is massive on a scale of thousands of kilometers in diameter and is the precursor to their more advanced tech that they'll be using on gas giants like Crusader, which we're going to be able to fly down into. Oh, and I forgot to mention they also buffed the Kani, which has been a long time coming. So if you've got a Kani, you might be surprised to find that it is a legitimately formidable ship in 312, so have fun guys. If you guys want to learn more about what the gas cloud tech is going to do for the future of Star Citizen, there's actually a lot more to it and I created an entire video based on that subject which you can already find up on my channel. 312 has also seen a rebalance of mining in a really good way. You'll now find valuable stuff in higher quantities and higher densities per rock. And you'll also find bigger rocks that you'll need a mole to actually engage with. So you'll not be able to mine every single rock by yourself, which is great because the mole really didn't have a place in Star Citizen before this patch. As you'll probably see, they also updated the mining UI to be a heck of a lot clearer and show a bit more useful information, including your current speed, which is great to prevent yourself from drifting into a rock or into the ground. A lot of miners are going to be very thankful for that addition. But miners might initially be a little bit confused with 312 because their rock yields aren't giving them as much profit as they used to. And that's because refineries have been added into 312 as well. In this process, you can take your load to a select number of stations, CRUL1, HERL1, MICL1, and uh, ARCL1. So all the major planets have a refinery nearby. Once you've filled up on whatever you're mining, you can take it on over to the refinery and have it refined into a better material. Now, one of the good things about this process is that it happens independently from the server, so even if the server 30Ks, as long as you get that mining or that refining order in, it's going to stay until you log back in again or until you come back to the station after another session of mining. Luckily, this refinery process, which I still have much to learn about, will yield higher profits for miners who choose to use them than mining in general yielded before this patch. So although mining by itself will not yield as much profit, if you use the refining feature in stations, you will make more money. Speaking only of the refinery decks, they are really impressive visually, so they're definitely worth visiting even if you aren't into mining. And yes, to answer your question, you can jump into these pits and kill yourself if you really wanted to try it. I knew you guys would ask, so I added this clip in. Okay, 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 if I'm honest, I, I wanted to find out too, so <laughs> I can't blame, I can't just blame you guys. Also really cool and sure to be added to my next guide is the fact that these stations also now have a complete one-stop shop for mining in general, whether it be in ships or on the ground. You can find suits, backpacks, mining tools, flares, helmets. You can even find out what certain elements look like if you're new to the game and are curious, and you can also rent ships straight from the mining support center. 
If you're curious about trying out the refining process for yourself, you can find it in the overseer's office, which is up the stairs. It's the same in every station right now, so it should be relatively easy for you to find if you look around one of these decks long enough. And to start the process is also pretty simple. All you gotta do is find one of these refining stations and select the ship that you have items in to refine and begin the process. Though the process of refining itself is much more complex as far as I can tell, there are different types of refining processes that you can use in order to refine materials that take varying levels of time, and I suspect that these different processes actually have different yield results and will work better and worse for certain materials. So you're probably going to want to pay attention to this, and that's why I need to make a separate video about this because I don't fully understand it yet, and I haven't had time to go into it with all my focusing on some of the other features that I want to talk to you about in this video. Once the refinement process is done, you can transfer the refined materials into a cargo and then sell it, either at the station that you refined at or at a select other station where you may be able to get more profit for your refined materials. Just be careful if you're shipping because you can 30k. But now it's time to ramp up this video to get to some of the more intense stuff, the stuff that really affects the gameplay, and one of those things is the introduction of the Aegis Idris which is a UEE capital ship carrier. It's not the biggest one that they have, but it's the first true capital ship to make its way into the PU, and it comes in the form of an NPC ship. There are currently several ways to get it to appear. You can either do it the legit way by following a chain of missions and eventually getting the Arlington Gang mission, which ends with a giant Idris fight uh, that is owned by pirates, or you can attack one of the stations of Stanton and build up enough heat to get the Idris to come out and play. Though I warn you, the UEE Navy Idris is different than the pirate version in that it is a lot tougher to fight. It comes with a nasty size 10 railgun which can one-shot pretty much any ship that it hits except for an 890 jump. We've attempted to take this thing down three separate times this past week, and in each instance, either we couldn't get it to appear, or when we did, we just did not have enough firepower to destroy it before we were interrupted by somebody trying to come and ruin the fun. It's partly to do with the fact that in 312, they've also rebalanced torpedoes. Now they're targetable, and the AI will actually attempt to shoot them down before they hit the target. And so unless you use absolutely overwhelming force to attack an Idris, you're just not going to be able to break its shields. I am legitimately recommending that you have like 20 to 30 people with you with some retaliators on queue ready to come in to start shooting at it once you break its weapon so that it can't shoot them down. You just can't take too long to do this because if you're going the route of attacking a UEE Idris, you're going to have the heat of all the bounty hunters on the server trying to come and ruin your fun. One of the cool things about the Idris fight though, if you get to see one for yourself, is that it also has introduced a number of really cool new features that CIG is working on. Stuff like the new shield tech, which is really impressive looking, it is absolutely gorgeous to witness in person, and it's a great place to witness some of the newer VFX that CIG's added into the game, like explosions, weapons fire, all of them are way more impressive in 312 than they've ever been in the past, with a lot more oomph to the base when stuff goes off. It really does feel impressive when, even aside size 2 or 3 explodes on the side of a hull. It does make a sound that everybody notices and turns to look at. And now we arrive at the very biggest and most important feature of 312, and yes, even the year. I'm of course speaking about the reputation system in Star Citizen. Now I know this might not seem like a really big feature, but hear me out here on why this is so important. In 312, Reputation is going to be what determines what missions are available to you. In the past, you were either a good guy or a bad guy, and that status didn't really stick with you for very long. If you died, it reset. Now, for things like bounty hunting, you're going to have to pay the bounty hunting guild to take assessments to determine whether or not you're good enough to be a bounty hunter for them. And if you fail, you'll lose reputation with them and have to wait a bit before you can take that assessment again. Each time you are able to successfully complete a contract, you're given more opportunities to do more and more higher paying contracts. What's really important about this is that this is what's going to create chains of missions which lead up to some crescendo in things like theme parks which are very traditional sorts of experiences in MMOs. And also very importantly with this patch is that it is persistent between deaths, between resets, and between 
patches. It does not matter if you leave a server or rejoin it, the game is going to now remember which missions you took and your status with each faction in the game. This means that if you are continually playing the bad guy in Star Citizen by killing players and NPCs, that the factions in the game, the UEE, Crusader Security, Loreville, all the different areas of Stanton and all their different NPC factions will remember what you've done for the better and for the worse, depending on which direction you want to go. So by being the bad guy, you're going to have unlocked for you certain mission givers which are specifically targeted at your type of gameplay. But if you're on the flip side, a primarily bounty hunter or good guy player, you're going to have a different set of unique mission givers giving you tasks to complete so that you can build reputation with them and see the effects it'll make on your character's ability to do various things in the world of Star Citizen. But no matter which route you choose, either to be the good guy or the outlaw, you're going to be rewarded by it by having unique missions available to you that give you unique rewards, and even some physical rewards that you can get in-game to wear in your player, or maybe even fly as ships. But that's coming in later patches, unfortunately that's not in this specific patch. Those rewards and missions, that is. Because there are missions in the game now, like the bounty hunting set missions, and even the assassination missions, which are on the flip side if you're an outlaw, that you can build up to get better contracts with. This makes reputation one of the most important currencies in the world of Star Citizen, and it's also going to be why you're going to want to avoid dying in the future when a death of a spaceman is introduced, because they've said that one of the things that you're going to lose if your character perma dies is the reputation that you've had with the factions that you've built a relationship with up until your death. This is going to make it really scary for some players who decide to be the outlaw because they're always going to have to live with the fear of dying, and same goes for those of you who decide to go in more difficult areas of the verse that maybe have more crime. It's also going to make having stuff like escorts and medics really important to make sure that you stay alive. Now just as a quick refresher because I'm sure some of you are going to freak out in the comment section like the last time I mentioned this feature, Permadeath is not something that happens on your first death. You need to die a couple of times and your body needs to be pretty beat up for you to perma-die. And even when you perma-die, you don't lose all your ships or all your stuff. Much like in life, all of your stuff will pass on to your next of kin, or in other words, a new character that you make in your same account. The main thing about Death of a Spaceman is that it brings meaning to death. It means that you want to try to avoid it, and thus the way that you act in-game is going to reflect that, and that's exactly what Chris Roberts wants to have happen. So don't worry guys, you're still going to be able to have fun, it just means that you're probably not going to want to do a kamikaze run because it will have consequences. So all in all, this patch has shaped up to be far more impressive than I ever would have suspected. There's a lot of content in this patch to experience, and there's even more coming before the end of the year in what is called the Xeno Threat, which is going to be a player versus player versus NPC event where you can choose sides. I don't know all the details yet, and we'll be exploring that in a future video, so stay tuned for that and make sure you're subscribed, and hit that notification button so that you know the next time I post a video about Star Citizen. For me, I think that 312 has really changed my outlook on the status of Star Citizen this year in 2020. It started off pretty rough, and through the middle of the year I felt a little depressed with where we were going, but here at the end, we're really finishing very strong with some solid features that are really important for the future of the game. But what do you guys think? Let me know down in the comment section below. Do you agree that this reputation system is the single biggest feature of the year, or perhaps since planets? I'm looking forward to seeing your replies. I've been Morphologist, I'll see you next time.